tahu sistem ini Yep, all good. Take it away, Jeremy. Thank you. All right, let me get the right slides to share. Yeah. All right, so can you see that? Is that getting the right view? Yep. Yep. All right, well, good evening, everybody. My name is Jeremy Wilkin. I am also known as Gnome on the Run on various platforms. Uh, I have been a little quiet on Twitter for a while, but uh, nevertheless, I still have that. We're going to talk about design systems today, but quickly, a little about me. Uh, I live in Austin, Texas in the US, and I don't have an accent. No, I was not born here, but uh, I do live here now. Uh, I work as an engineering manager. I also worked for five years or so on uh, the Clarity Design System, which is one of the open source design systems out there built with Angular uh, in mind. I've been a Google developer expert for Angular and the Google Assistant for um, five or six years now, and also written a couple of books, one on Angular and one on Ionic. So I find that uh, this is a these topics are things I'm very interested in, like to share. But overall, my focus is ultimately on like how to bring these things together and to make something meaningful with that. So, without much more about me, let's actually quickly define what I mean by a design system because I think there's uh, a lot of ideas what a design system is or could be. But it's actually, in my mind, fairly uh, encompassing of several different things. So a design system to me is more than just these components. They're not just a handful of components that you're sharing. That may be just a set of uh, a component library, if you will. These are just things that have been reused across maybe your applications or in different places. And they may or may not have really been thought of and designed as a unit. Well, in a design system, it should be that they are coherently uh, designed, that they have consistency across each of the pieces, that they feel like they're part of the same design system, that they weren't just built in one place and uh, moved over to some shared place and reused in a bunch of other places. You've probably seen websites where there's different types of buttons and different types of UI controls on different pages, and you think these just aren't the same. Um, a design system should bring clear guidance about how these implementations should look, how these pieces should fit together. So it's more than just technical coding. There's got to be good documentation, good design uh, associated with that. Um, and essentially, to me, this is about common language between designers and developers so that when someone says, we're going to talk about this component. There's a very clear understanding of what that is and what it's used for, and almost as important, what it's not used for. Because often we find ways, hey, I could use this and make it work if I just tweak everything a little bit, and it'll be perfect for this. But really, it's about trying to find ways to make it work for uh, design and development to talk about these things as if they're the same thing. So high level, like well, how do you build a design system? That means you do need some design support. Uh, some people are good at design and development or kind of sit in the both both spaces. Um, ideally, you do have some type of relationship with designers, whether that's the if you're in a company that has officially hired designers, maybe it's other freelancers or, or even just if you can find somebody who's had more exposure to design principles and ideas that can help a lot, even if you don't have a full time designer. Think of it as also bringing consistency for this brand, whether you're thinking of it as a brand for like a company or just brand for the application that you're building. The concept of a brand is important where you have a look and a feel that just resonates throughout the application. And if you build that design system right, it allows you to maintain that consistently throughout. And if you ever update, it's a lot easier to propagate and, and bring those changes through other parts of the system so it's it's great to centralize and bring those things together but you need to be thoughtful about it and we're going to talk a little bit about 
how would you start building one or, or bring this all together? All right, so let's build with Angular. So I've got, uh, I think, 12, 12 kind of tips or, or, or things to think about when it comes to creating uh, a design system and starting with Angular. And the first is probably the true thing for any Angular project, start with the CLI. Um, this is pretty common today. Even when I started talking about design systems, the, the build tooling and the things were often very different from project to project. It might use the Angular CLI in some places, but uh, the more complex applications today still often find um, that you might use other tools as well. But with the CLI, you just don't have to create a lot of stuff. It's supported by the Angular team. There's a lot of best practices that come right out of the box. And you can keep up to date with some of the benefits of how Angular itself is evolving. For example, over time, Angular has changed the way that it's shipping uh, bundled code in between libraries because of, uh, particularly because of the Ivy rendering engine. And it's trying to find a way to bring compatibility between different versions of Angular, but also uh, bring the improvements forward so that if you're using a newer version of the library that has the latest uh, Angular CLI uh, as part of the build tooling, then people will get some of the benefits for optimizations and so forth. So it's best to stay up to date and to use the CLI because most of those things are kind of hidden from you and abstracted away. So it's really helpful. So uh, this you've probably seen these commands but if you want to do it it's this is the simple set of commands that would allow you to do this so you first install the cli with the first line create a new project but then ng generate library and then you give it a name you know, it might be my system come up with a better name that's not a great name but and then you just build it like you would any other part of the cli ng build dash dash prod with the name my system or you can then also publish it if you happen to want to publish it into NPM, or maybe you have another way of distributing it. There's ways that you can take that output and share that. So using the CLI is really helpful. Um, there's some configuration and things that the CLI helps with to help link libraries and where you consume them. So uh, make sure you're up to date. Sometimes that uh, that has changed somewhat over time. How libraries may need to be linked into a project if you did this a while ago so keep that in mind but do oops sorry i on the wrong screen uh do utilize the cli because it will make your life significantly easier next this is an important thing and kind of the overarching thing about most of this is that you're going to want to think through and define your plan ahead of time before you just go off and, and start throwing stuff together and making a, a shared library or something. So what can happen in many cases is uh, when you're building a design system, you start with, well, what are we using in multiple places? Where do I see duplication? So you go off and you find, okay, we've got a button here and a button there. Let's just use one of them. And then you say, oh, we've got a, a modal here and a modal there. They're different. Let's just use one of them. So you start to pull them out and put them in a bucket that you call your design system. But those that button and that modal maybe aren't even thought through as far as how are they designed, how are they consistent, uh, how are they inconsistent. So if they were built independently, it's often that you, you miss some of this upfront planning. Don't forget to do that. Step back and take care of that. So the first step, I think, is defining an API style. This is taking a look at how Clarity uh, defines an API. And so everything is passed through here as uh, bindings. Some people will want you to um, create different ways of constructing your API. For example, we're in this users per page block here, we're, we're expecting that the application will give us the text here. We don't, in this case, want to um, automatically write that out for them because then there's something like the translation becomes a problem if you have to translate inside of your own components. And then we also have uh, cases where we're binding to in the, the um, 
pagination, pound pagination here. And that gives us access to properties, to values on that component so we can get what's the current page uh, or number of items, um, how many total items are there. So we've come up with some of these consistent rules. And if you look at different components, you'll see there's other things like CLR prefix. Uh, we use fairly descriptive terms, so there's no collisions. Um, the component names themselves are also prefixed very clearly, and you see a lot of consistency across. Um, you can see there's one example down here of CLR data grid where we didn't do that, and for historical reasons, that was just a mistake, but this is an example of where we messed up and should have put a CLR here. But overall, you can see we're fairly consistent in our naming. So set some time aside and even if you are pulling things together later just think about how do you want to make sure things are named how do you avoid collisions um, it can be really confusing if you see the name maybe we just use options in a bunch of places options binding here options binding there it could quickly get out of hand to understand what's the differences so think through your api style and conform to that and there are some tools and linting things that might help with that, but uh, depending on how you structure your API, different things may be um, useful. One last note, this is kind of common general Angular, but do not, uh, as much as you can, avoid making this last example where you're passing in an object as a binding. Like large objects to configure something, there may be some cases like charts where that may be necessary from time to time, but I, I recommend avoiding that because it really makes the um, surface area difficult to work with, and as well as it makes it really hard to, to manage all of the things. It's easy to implement because you're just taking one object and, and then it configures everything, but it can also make things really complicated because now you're in control of this huge object that could have anything inside of it. And it's harder to control, it's harder to validate every single piece, and also the type checking and various values that you can get through Angular, like this one here, clear DG page size, Angular knows that this needs to be a number. So it would throw an error if you didn't pass a, a valid number. But in an object, you know, it's very loose and free form and stricter type checking may be able to catch some of that, but it, it's just a lot more difficult and complicated, especially when properties are optional here and there. So Thinking through that is really careful. Uh, be very careful about following this pattern. In fact, avoid it at all costs if you can. All right, number three, use more providers. I think this is something that people maybe don't consider and they use providers or services, but you may not use it as well or as extensively as you could. So for example, uh, you can build a service that's got all the things that a component needs, and maybe it does five or six different things. I'm suggesting that it's better in most cases to break that into five different smaller services than one large one. And if possible, make them unique, uh, I'm sorry, not unique, but generic, the opposite of unique, make them generic. And some things like uh, an open or closed service that keeps track of is something open or closed. Um, modals are opened or closed. Uh, accordions are opened and closed. All kinds of things have an open and closed state. And you might be able to reuse that provider in lots of different places without having to rethink that. And then you have a very common pattern across your API and in your internals. Providers are also great when you talk about nested components and structures. That's very helpful. Um, and I, I love the DI, the dependency injection system for Angular. So there's no reason not to leverage it. There's something to be thought of though when you talk about like global services and providers that go into the whole app and being thoughtful about where they need to be injected. So sometimes uh, it makes sense depending on what the service is trying to do. But in many ways, you probably wanna inject them just at the place they're needed. And lastly, think about uh, using observables whenever there's asynchronous data loading. So that's just another common Angular thing. But with the sense of events, you really want to focus on observables. So in this example, there are a couple of different services 
And so let's imagine we've got this form component and this this form component is like a container for forms. And our forms maybe have different layouts. Maybe it's got a vertical or a horizontal form, uh, different formats maybe like that. So we may have a service that can communicate to the form component, hey, what's the layout? And then we've got these different actual internal UI controls, like an input. So these things all can, can take a look in this example, this is what we actually built in some of the uh, Clarity system, that there are these different pieces of the services that manage different pieces of information. So one of them managed to give each input a unique ID on the HTML element. That's important for accessibility reasons and uh, make sure that the, the label and the input are linked together. We would automatically resolve that. So we had a control ID service and that was in used with all of our form control components. So they all shared that. And so we built that one provider and reused it however many times, 10 times, 15 times, I don't know, um, and repeated that. So those providers made it really useful because they were general. But if we put all this stuff together, not every control maybe uses every single of these services. So when they were smaller, it was easy to use the ones that we needed when we needed them. And then if we didn't need it, we could leave it out. If we put it all in one big blob, it gets a lot harder to maintain and understand. So, okay, I should have been skipping through. So this describes, yeah, as we go through different uh, services come in and understand the layout. So for example, the layout service tells the form component, which layout are we using vertical, okay? And then that's passed along and the input component then decides how do I structure my layout so that I'm laid in the, the correct um, direction. All right, uh, something uh, I'm calling overload directives, I think is a really powerful tool at times. It's also something that you need to be thoughtful about, but uh, this is really when you're looking at how can I add behaviors to an existing element without having to mix all of that behavior into one place. So a directive can have a similar, a, a selector that is same as something else and apply additional behaviors. So think about a ways that you might be able to separate some of the complex logic or create usability. And this is something that gets a little bit tricky and something that I think you need to be very thoughtful about when you do this, but it's a very powerful tool when it is actually implemented. So here's an example of what this could look like. Uh, this is from code uh, examples as well. So in this component, which is clear DG cell, we have a template and it's just projecting content. So it's a very simple component, nothing special about it. Uh, I, I cut off the rest of the class, but it, it does very little beyond just basically showing information. Then we have this director, which also has directive has the same selector and this watches the life cycle. So it does some rendering stuff. So it's looking to see if things are changing and when it changes, it might need to recalculate the size of the cell. So it's doing some work that is separate from the component itself. It's looking at sort of the space around it. So in this case, this directive gives this component additional capabilities and logic but it separates it into separate place so that it's easier to maintain and it, it helps keep the code from becoming like really complicated spaghetti code. And multiple examples of this exist in the code base. So you could go take a look at them, but the point here is that these, um, we call them renderers, these different renderer directives, we have them for different pieces and they're all doing similar things, but they're kind of in a unique space. So there's some shared logic that they'll have, but then there's some unique things for each of them because a row is different from a cell inside of a, a table. So row size depends on the size of the space, but the cell depends on the size of how many cells are there in the row and, and so forth. So there's different like calculations that occur, but we've been able to separate that out. So that's the key thing here is thinking about how can you overload a component and add some additional complexity without mixing all of that into one place. So overloading directives, something that can be really powerful, but it's also something to be 
thoughtful about using when you're coding because you do this too much it might also make things harder so there's sort of a reason that we split these up in this case uh, the renderer is like all of this logic around sizing of this particular element how big does it how what's the size the width and the height uh, versus the cell itself and the component there is really what's the content and did it change or update so finding ways to separate the logic barrier is also useful creating shared utilities this is similar to the providers and these overload directives but there's some things that might be repeated throughout and not really specific to any one thing you might want to create like a separate module just for that internal library and I say internal it may be internal to your design system only or it may be shared utilities that applications also will use so there's a difference if it's just stuff that you're using internally within the design system source code you don't expect applications to ever use it you can still pull that out into a separate place just to help keep a little bit of uh, separation and you think about things differently when they're in a different space as well so some examples being um, animation stuff, uh, drag and drop related services, internationalization concepts. These things are reused in lots and lots of places, but they may only be specific to those components you're building and not for the apps to use. So you might create a shared utility module for that, and you can share that around your different uh, components and, and parts of your design system. That way you've got all that stuff in one place. And again, if you're thinking about, okay, we're going to have one service that handles the animation logic that we want to use, uh, you can create that service and then reuse it in all these different places, again, through that shared utilities directory. And some of it's simpler just because if it's in one module, then it gets shared and you don't have to think about providing and injecting every single uh, piece of that. Because for some things, like uh, an example was some of the work we did on drag and drops services was, both directives and services. So you had to remember to inject the service and the directives into, uh, into the system correctly or something wouldn't work. So sometimes wrapping that up and making it easy to consume is really, really helpful. So shared utilities are, are a powerful tool, but uh, also can be a bottleneck if you put too much in there or things that maybe really aren't shared utilities, maybe you don't need to put everything in it. So Good rule of thumb is if it's used in three or more places and it's a good idea Two, maybe one definitely not avoid dependencies this one's huge and it's really really hard but it's also really important the more that you can create value with without adding third-party libraries the, the better you will be or minimizing the third-party libraries that you need obviously you need angular but how many other things do you need? Do you need lots and lots of third party custom components that you just pull in and you might need them to help get you started, but in a design system, these things can make it really hard to manage long-term because of the speed in which those components might be updated. There could be conflicts, they might be hard to work with or worse, they become abandoned. And so you wanna think really carefully, is this dependency something that's worth the cost to maintain and it's not just you as a design system team managing that, it's all the teams who use your design system who are also managing those dependencies. If you can avoid it, don't add it. And if you build it yourself, maybe it's better to just build it, especially little things. If they're not that big, create them yourself. You can look at the source code of some of these components and get some inspiration, but bringing more of that under the umbrella will probably serve you better in the long term than um, starting from a bunch of cobbled together pieces because then it's really hard to manage. You get a lot of extra code bloat because lots of stuff, you just don't know how big these components are. They definitely won't have the same look. They won't have the same API design. They won't have uh, you know even similar colors. So the more work you have to do to manage third-party code, the less time you have to work on really important stuff. So it's a fine line. It's not always the same for everybody in different apps. And maybe at the beginning you use more, but then you try to get rid of them. But where of caution is once you add it, it's hard to remove it. So be very thoughtful about that and when possible, just avoid them entirely. 
that said, you may want to use like a design system. If you're going to use something like Angular Material or Clarity or something like that, you know, that's your that's your major dependency. Minimize the small ones after that, I should say. Schematics. I hope you're familiar with at least what schematics are, but if not, these are really useful, basically little script utilities that can execute tasks for you. Um, every time you run an Angular CLI command, you're actually running some kind of schematic. And these are really useful for adding things to applications. It could be you know, generating new uh, components and things like that. It also could be used for updates. So for example, let's say you renamed your components for some reason. You could write a schematic that when somebody upgrades, upgrades with Angular uh, and uses the update for your component as well, that a new um, update script will run and it'll help them go find all of the old names and replace them with the new ones. Um, something that we've done before. Uh, or maybe it's even generic where it's trying to generate, maybe you have like an app layout that you like to use that you want to promote. So maybe you have different types of uh, displays. So there's like a, a detail view, a list view. Uh, maybe you have a, a home page or a login page. Maybe some of these things could be uh, standardized as with a schematic where anybody who needs to create a new page that follows one of these patterns just has to do ng generate and then whatever the the custom schematic command is uh, that would allow apps to quickly generate new things with that so it's great for you know replacing boilerplate code and generating that quickly and uh, something that takes a little bit of time to get up to speed with and to make it successful but as you scale out if you're doing this with lots of teams or with uh, teams that you don't even communicate with if it's an open source project. Schematics can be very powerful to help ease the transitions, uh, get started because you could simply say, run these three commands and then you have generated a sample app that has sample data and all of your components in it. It could be really powerful. Um, on the other hand, that's a lot of time to spend for something that may be done once just during setup. So you know, what's the right value proposition? How useful is it to you? but uh, they're relatively easy. They're largely uh, written like node scripts, but the documentation is available on the Angular site to get started with schematics, especially the updates. I think the my updates or the migration schematics are, are really helpful if you can to help people stay up to date. All right, next, nested components. This is something that will happen when you start building more complex Angular design systems. In fact, it's probably better to have a few more components than trying to make one large component that does a lot of things automatically. So for example, there's sort of a minimum responsibility that each component should have. And when you can break that down so that you don't have too many responsibilities in a single component. This will lead to having to figure out parents and child communications. You can do this in different ways. There's providers or services. You can pass data over bindings, and then you can actually grab an instance through view child or content child or, or children to get the actual component instances and, and access methods and properties there. Um, but I find those are more brittle and that makes more public methods or properties. So avoid that when you can, because if people see in their autocomplete that they can grab a hold of some value on this component, uh, they probably will. And that can lead to this complication of um, creating code uh, pathways that you didn't intend people to use. And if you ever change something, maybe that gets renamed and you don't think anyone's actually using it, uh, it can turn into an issue where you break people's implementations because they're kind of reaching inside of your component and and messing with it. So the fewer public properties, the better. And uh, finally, avoid the coupling of components as well. You don't really want to nest them if they don't need to be. Here's an example. This is an accordion. So you've got a, a bar here that if you click and opens this form here, and if you click here and here, you know each step will open and expand a new piece. Well, there's 
how many components are there? Uh, we have, I think I counted eight components in here. Um, and we're not even going to all of them. So there's the component, which is this outer container, which hosts the accordion itself. The, the next one is this header bar. And then there's one for this name, this text and description that goes inside. And then there's what, you know, the actual name and description are components. And then we've got the form components in here. This container is a component. So you see there's lots of nested things going on here. This is normal and angular. But being very thoughtful about how these things connect and communicate is important. Um, so this is an accordion or stepper. You can see how they're related to each other through this. So thinking through this and kind of mapping these relationships will help again with where do I need providers or, or, or my services? Um, how are these things going to connect and relate to each other? What's generic about them that could be abstracted? Um, what are the unique things? In this case, I want a title, I want a description, I want a content to each have sort of their own areas of responsibility. And then how does this all come together? And here's if expanded, this is one of those uh, overloaded directive, not this is an overloaded directive. This is more of a directive service thing where if something's expanded, it's similar to open or closed, but we say expanded. And in this case, um, it's a generic system to check, is it open or expanded? And basically shows and hides content based on that. So thinking about the structure, drawing this out is really helpful ahead of time if you can. And this may evolve over time and you may find that you need to add new things and that's fine. But if you overdo it in the beginning, that can also be a problem. So again, test some of these things out, try a little bit of before you ship any code, like build some simple things out. Don't add all the behaviors, but create like these simple containers as components, put them together in an implementation and see how does that work? Is it giving you the, you know, the separation of concerns that you want? Is it giving you the, um, overall structure that you're hoping to see, or is it too much or too little? And some of that's trial and error and takes time to figure out because we didn't start with all of this. We probably started with only a few of these and expanded over time as we found more needs to, to incorporate these pieces. Number nine, budget your tech debt. So this is a perennial problem and it's not specific to design systems, but it is a huge challenge in a design system because this is something that is shared and it propagates across everything. So when you create new code, it, test it well. It's better to do a little bit less well than it is to do a lot fast because you're going to have to spend a lot of time maintaining this. And maybe you're working on it all together as you're building out your app. Maybe the design system is, is separate from everything else and sort of maintain on its own. But there's a development cycle that happens. If you find a bug and it's in the app, but you figure out that the bug actually can be traced back to the design system, okay, well, now you've got to log an issue with the design system. Somebody there's got to fix it. Maybe you're the same person. You know, in a small team, maybe that is a little bit faster, but the bigger the team or the bigger the project, the more communication, the more challenge there is in keeping track, uh, updating, an update then has to be released and then you have to consume it. This can take minimum hours if things are really tight, but often days or weeks uh, for that to be fully resolved. And so it helps to focus on budgeting ahead of time saying, I know that I'm gonna need to spend, and my experience is 40 to 50% of time was spent on bugs, fixing tooling like your CI or CD pipeline if you have something set up. Uh, community, whether that's internal, external, open source, whoever is using the system, um, updating and maintaining documentation. And you need documentation for yourself just as much as you need it for others. But uh, this can take nearly half of your time if you're not careful about it. And um, people can get away with less, but the quality suffers, the consistency suffers. And as a, a design system, goals are to make such a high quality uh, impact on consistency and brand, this is a, a key part. So budget your tech debt, don't underestimate it. Um, it's more than you might expect. So start with less because that's easier to maintain. One thing that's been very popular 
in recent uh, years is this concept of design tokens. You've maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't, and it's not terribly complicated or different from the past. But there's some really important things about it. Uh, oh, this one has animations. Cool. So design tokens are kind of like standards. You're going to define your variables and say, all right, we're going to define this is the set of colors. This is the set of spacing options. And there, there could be hundreds of these variables that you define. The idea is that it's sort of in an agnostic format. Maybe it's a, a JSON object or XML, which can then be exported into different outputs like SAS, JavaScript, maybe CSS custom properties, or even mobile formats for like iOS or Android. And that you would have a similar um, name and output for each of those things so that if you're building across your different parts of your company, maybe you've got a mobile app, and, and a website, those teams could share the same assets, the same design tokens, so you at least have some baseline consistency. So this is really powerful. This is a link if you search envisionapp.com inside design slash design tokens. This is a really good overview. Um, I don't know when they first started showing up. A couple of years ago, this term kind of came up. I think it came from Salesforce originally, but I can't remember. But more and more folks are using design tokens. And the point is that you're consistently laying out what you think of as uh, consistent variables that need to be accessed ac across the app. So you're not writing color codes into your app in 10 hundred places. So this might be an example of what it could look like. Um, on the top here is sort of a sample of here's a JSON object. So we've got this layout object, which then has a property of space which then has a property of XXS. So we might have then, you might have a, a list of these. So there'd be like extra, extra small, extra small, small, medium, large, and then so on, right? Whatever the size nomenclature you want to use. But then we would specify in this case uh, that it's a token size of two. And two in this case is two units, two units of measurement. And in web, that would output as two pixels. Uh, or, or two could be uh, P, is it PT? There's different values that are equated uh, across, you know, uh, iOS or Android. They don't necessarily use pixels, but they're, so this is a little helper utility to like translate to into the different types of units, depending on what your target is. But in this case, we're looking at some CSS. So this would convert this object and use the naming, like this structured, long form name. So this is a CSS custom property of token layout space extra extra small and that equals two pixels. So think about this being uh, far more complicated. You could have uh, sets of colors. You could have like a blue swatches and green swatches and dozens of swatches. You could have spacing. You could have uh, topography choices. Maybe there's three or four font choices. These all could be set up as design tokens so that these different projects all use it the same way. What's really powerful is if apps also use this, not just the design system, but if apps use this, then if you ever come in and change, let's say the color scheme of the app, maybe you have like a set of colors that are like your primary, secondary, and tertiary. Well, if you ever tweak the colors for any reasons, if apps are using the same custom properties, the same CSS values that you are because they're leveraging your tokens, uh, then as soon as they update the library, your code has been updated, their code is updated, everybody's using the same thing. So this is a really powerful medium, but it can be uh, challenging in the long run to um, get it started because you've probably got a lot of these values strewn throughout the system, throughout your code base and whatnot. So it takes some time to go in and like, search them all out, pull them out, put them into this design token system. So again, plan ahead. The more you can do this ahead of time, the easier it will be down the road. Um, there's some systems out there. There's some tools that help with converting from a design token to these different formats. So you can take a look at those, uh, or you could build something that's really, you can tell it's pretty simple. It's conceptually, it's very simple. You're just creating a list of these uh, properties, um, depending on what file formats you need to support. All right, some things to avoid. 
things that you should really, really, really not do uh, as best as you can. First, with an Angular, do not touch the DOM directly, which is do not let query selector type behaviors. Um, and if you have to do that, don't. Just don't do it. Um, use the renderer. Use the proper methods to do that. I've seen this in Angular components where someone's like, oh, I just need to add this little uh, attribute to the DOM element. Okay, don't do that. Use the bindings. Use the renderer. Use something else. Uh, that will dramatically improve the quality of the end result. It also helps avoid problems that will keep you from server-side rendering if you do anything like that because things like uh, document don't exist on the server. So that would probably fail on a server-side rendering system. Don't type with any, use your strict typing. So create interfaces or, or strictly define the different types, whether they're um, inputs, outputs, properties, methods, what, are their, what do they accept, what do they return? Add as much as you can. And you may have to export some of your custom interfaces to help teams know what what those objects are and uh, th that's really helpful so avoid any if you're starting fresh there then don't let that ever get turned on like make sure the ts config settings don't allow this that you have to do strict typing but if they um if it is turned on then it may be worth going through and trying to flip the flag in your ts config and then go through and quickly go and fix as many as you can uh, that could take a while depending on how old the code is and if you've been very diligent about that. But it makes a huge difference for people using your code base because strict typing will alert them to errors. It will show up in their IDE as they're editing if they um, use the wrong values. So if you put any, it's just going to be too easy for them to make mistakes and for you as well. Uh, this is what I just mentioned before, you know, accessing any of the native element or or any anything that might be a native web API that isn't necessarily available in Node.js without doing a platform check will likely break server-side rendering. So just don't use it. Um, even some of the interfaces, if you're trying to think about it, try to use the Angular equivalents when available. I kind of mentioned this earlier, but when you're passing values as an input to something and an input binding definitely don't pass functions but avoid complex objects as much as possible and if it is an object like if it is that one example where it was standalone true i think or whatever the options was uh make sure that if you do end up doing that that the option or the object i'm sorry itself is very simple the bigger it is the harder it is to maintain and support and just can get really unwieldy don't force apps to conform to your library. You need to be as you know, flexible and generic as possible. What I mean here is that sometimes you expect that they'll structure things and organize things in a certain way. Maybe they'll always use it in a certain way. Um, that will likely break down over time. So be, you know, be aware that as soon as apps are using that library, that, that design system, they're probably going to find ways to use it that you didn't anticipate. So you, you probably can't even force them. But there may be ways that you try to detect and say, hey, don't do this, don't do that. That can limit their ability to um, customize or to get their job done as well. So you want to be thoughtful about putting limits on what people can do. You don't want them to just rip it apart and do anything, but you also want to limit what, they, uh, what they're doing within reason. So don't put everything into one mega module. You want to separate. So if you've got, let's say you've got 10 components, but some of those components maybe have child components. So for example, like the, the stepper or accordion, that's maybe one module, but it has five or six sub components inside of it. Those make sense together because they're always going to be used together. But you want to put them in their own modules that way so that tree shaking works and, and angular at least this is true today this may get improved in just a moment I'll, I'll share a little more about this but uh if you have just one module and you throw everything in it for your design system then that whole module was likely to be kept 
it cannot tree shake at the component level, at least last I checked, which wasn't that long ago. Um, although Angular does make improvements, so it's occasionally uh, this kind of stuff gets resolved by the CLI system. But better to think of it as for each of these UI controls, like an accordion, a modal, a data table, you want a module to contain all of that stuff. That will help with the tree shaking, um, and you can still export them all into another mega module under that they'll all be underneath. Uh, this is true with Clarity. It can tree shake out modules that are not used, but only at the module level. So you want to create like these sub modules under your design system per component, and then the tree shaking should work. Two more things, don't throw exceptions. Anything you do as a design system, your code is somewhere else. And if it's included in someone else's app, it's going to be really confusing if it starts throwing exceptions or doing anything that breaks the app. So you want to handle errors as gracefully as possible. It makes it easy to use, or at least less frustrating. You could put console logs or warnings when appropriate, but really avoid catastrophic changes, like throwing in an exception, because you just break you just broke their app. And uh, maybe the bug isn't bad enough to cause other problems. Maybe it is, but uh, you don't want to be, you don't want the design system to be the one leading that charge. And finally, uh, don't forget about accessibility. This is one of the challenges that uh, can be really hard is all of the reasons are, are out there to, to focus on accessibility. The, the key point is that getting it right is hard. Good design is important. Good implementation is important. Um, and sometimes they don't always, they're not designed and developed by people talking to each other. So make sure you communicate well with design folks, that you're talking to uh, other people who have accessibility training or strengths to know what is what is going to work or what might not work. Um, and generally accessibility is good for all. So these are things that you should likely improve the overall quality in general. But sometimes people get really focused in on, oh, this is how I want it to work. And they don't realize that it doesn't work very well for somebody who's not using a mouse. And so that behavior actually can become a problem. So you want to think through those things and, and read up to get up to speed a bit on accessibility. It takes some time to get really, really good at it, but a little bit of time can go uh, a long ways to making improvements. And then last, I only have a couple of things I want to share that are trends that I, I see coming and uh, coming or have already been done. So first is building components as web components. Uh, if you're not familiar with web components, this is more of a like, custom elements within HTML. So it's similar to Angular components, but doesn't require Angular to run these components. Uh, the benefit for this can be that you're able to execute uh, a, a design system that works across different platforms. And some web components may in the future be even renderable as uh, in more complex environments uh, like WebAssembly, or it might be useful in native apps. So there's there's possibilities where web components might be leading sort of a centralization of these shared components. Uh, GitHub uses them quite a bit. Um, I have several of the design systems, even ones that are built for Angular, underneath are actually using web components. Um, another couple of benefits is they're more abstracted from Angular, so they're harder for the apps to, to mess with or to break. So they're a bit more isolated, encapsulated. This can be really powerful. And uh, they typically use the uh, Shadow DOM, which also helps with styling. So lots of things can go really well, but it is nothing to start trying without a bit of practice and background because integrating them can take some time. It's a different tool chain. So if you're really full on Angular, these may or may not be useful for you depending on what you're trying to accomplish but there's quite a bit of uh, momentum in this direction and, uh, and they can be really powerful um, angular also has some implementations of web components you can create web components from angular components there's the documentation is available on uh, the angular documentation site those use cases kind of narrow they don't work well for design systems because it tends to work really well for exporting an Angular app as one component, so like the whole thing, or something really small, like just an individual component that's really small. The use case of a design system where there might be multiple small components working together, uh, 
the Angular tooling hasn't quite fleshed out and, and doesn't work very well with that behavior uh, last time I've worked with it. So um, Angular Elements may not get you there as a tool if you want to use web components. Um, a lot of folks use lit element as a web component base, but this is a trend. But if you're full on Angular, this may not be something you need to worry about, or at least you don't have to start thinking about it. You can definitely work with Angular and get really far and do everything you need to do. Uh, but there's some benefits to going into the web component space, especially for cross-platform, or if you really need um, a level of separation from your applications. Next, uh, standalone APIs. This is, uh, if you go take a look at the Angular blog, right now it's the current top list uh, blog post is around uh, a new standalone API. RFC, which is a request for comment. This is the idea that you could create components without modules and, and directives or services or pipes, I think. Maybe not services. So these components would necessarily need to be in a module. You would just be able to import a component directly uh, or directive and so forth. Um, this is still in early work, I think. I don't know at what point this will be officially released and made available but it is something to keep an eye on that it can help reduce some of the boilerplate of the different components that you need to create and putting them in modules and, and exporting them that way. So keep an eye on that. Their Angular team is going to be promoting the details around that as that uh, becomes more tangible. And uh, you can take a look at some of the stuff on their uh, request for comment. Um, in fact, please do comment. It's really interesting. Uh, and then finally, the last trend are in these micro front ends, which is kind of a combination of these two things where you're trying to create applications which are really just little elements that are independently built and then integrated at runtime. I see this desire and it takes many forms and many uh, approaches. And some of this comes with Webpack technology uh, improvements. Some of this is more of like a runtime custom, who knows what different people are trying to do. But the general theme is that they want to create a separation between these parts of the UI, but still load them as if they're one application so that different teams could use them or it's like a plugin that they can kind of hot swap different things in the page without uh, a lot of fuss. And this could be really powerful and really interesting, but I also caution this path for folks who aren't first really familiar with the, the trade-offs that you're gonna make. Uh, Runtime dependencies are very different than build time dependencies. So at runtime, you don't necessarily know if everything's going to go all right uh, until it's already running versus in a built dependency, you have that testing running before you ship the code. So be very thoughtful about micro front ends, but these things are making it possible to do more of that type of stuff. I expect to see more of that. A key thing to think about though in micro front ends as well is um, if they're all using your design system, those micro front ends might be copying and duplicating the code base that you have. So you might be shipping, if you've got five micro front end pieces on the screen, these are basically little independent web components, they might each import your design system and you might have five copies of it on the screen at once. And depending on how everything works and plays out, there could be conflicts, there could be different versions. It's at, at a minimum, it's extra code being loaded. So be thoughtful about that when you look at micro front ends. Uh, the dependencies are really big challenges. And so a design system is really at the heart of those things. So think through that before you go too far. And that is all I have to share today. Hopefully there's a good combination of some things to get started and some more complex uh, initiatives and things to go through. But that's what I've got for today. So I'll hand it over for questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, I think that's. I think this is something that um, has been probably been there in the tech ecosystem, like design systems and what it's all about. Um, not many might know much about it, but um, I think it's great that you've actually touched on that aspect of making sure that you think about how you want to architect your application even before you start. And like some of the, the parts that you've talked about, um, 
your components, your modules, your um, design tokens, and all that. Um, making sure that you, you put it in a compact way, in the sense that you know that if it's something that's going to be reusable, mm -hmm. you know where you have them and how you can use them across your application. Um, like just giving like a case in point on how we are at work is that we have something similar, and probably the, the the main idea is to have something that we can use it internally. And if so, if we have probably other products lined up, we can still use something. Um, for example, if, it's a, if some sort of like design tokens, put them up as an NPM package and then use it in other projects. And it's just going to be something like you just call on, uh, um, just in, install that package and then just call on those, for example, if it's utility classes or anything, and like everything is, is lined up for you. And you find like there's that pretty much consistency between all the products that you have in, in that company. So uh, what we've just said like is really, really great. So I'd like to open the floor to anyone who has questions. Please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask questions. Don't be shy. Anyone, yeah. <laughs> anyone can just ask. Probably if, as we wait uh, for someone to just admit themselves. So, um, on what level do you get to? I think I saw some place where you had like components having um, a custom name, right? Like things like CLR or something. Like, at mm -hmm. what level do you get to tweak that and say that I want all my components to have this selector name? Like, do you change something in a particular file or where exactly do you do that? So the naming of things, uh, you know, it's one of the hardest things in computer science, isn't that the, the, that and caching, right? So when when you think about the design system you create, so let's say it's my awesome library. So maybe you want to shorten that to M-A-L. Okay, my awesome library. So anything that you create for that library should have a unique prefix and you may come up with slightly different styles, right, for the component name, which are usually lowercase with dashes. For the properties and methods, those may be our camel case. That's what we did. Um, sometimes people use underscores. So finding ways to do that uh, consistently and then separate that out. When you have app components, they should have a different prefix. And any time that you're thinking about bringing those over, you need to go in and carefully rename and bring those names together so that they are correct for the design system, which of course changes some of the code who was using it before, but they're already going to have to update a little bit anyways. So might as well incur that cost then. So I think when you have different apps, right? And let's say you have five apps and they're all using this one design system or this, this set of library code. Um, that, that shared library needs to be very consistent. Um, we had some linting tools. I have to remember what it was because it's been so long since I set it up, but some tools that would go in and, and configure and check, did the components have the, the right name? So we, I think we took, we created what they called a golden file. And it's uh, basically, it's the, the, all the properties and methods of the component we would get a list of all of those things and scan and check for that. So obviously there's some of them are like ng on init, the angular stuff, we'd ignore that, but you want to look at all of the custom stuff that isn't there and see, does it fit my, my name? And that could help um, enforce that. So it's a test case in that, that way. Um, writing and getting some of that tooling set up can help a long ways, but it's a, you know, an upfront cost. Great, great. Anyone else has a question? Just unmute themselves and ask. I think I saw uh, Gilbert. Gilbert, do you have a question? I think there's a time you unmuted yourself. Gilbert, do you have a question? Any question if it's with regards to what he's touched on? And uh, I think the most notable parts that I personally 
um, liked was the avoid, the things to avoid. Uh, it's, it's something that probably for, for beginners, um, um, of course, you just be thrown out there like, yeah, you can do this, you can do that. Uh, but for most beginners, they might not really know how exactly to go about it. So if probably you could touch on um, the part of uh, things to do like uh, type system, like strict typing, like what, what, are, what are the benefits of strict typing when it comes to your Angular application? Yeah, so let me get back to that slide. Here we go. Um, so the, the strict typing means that Angular, well, really TypeScript, but then Angular can understand exactly what to expect when people are using your component. A lot of times we're building our applications and we know things. We just, we wrote it a while ago. We know, kind of remember, this is how this all works. And even if you get it wrong, you can quickly figure it out because you kind of have this memory. But when you're sharing code, it's probably written or managed by somebody else. And so the more you can enforce automatic checking, an automatic uh, with the IDE, it like gives you the um, the IntelliSense. Like if you're using Visual Studio Code and I start to use an input binding, it can little sh little pop up will show what type of value it expects. Does it expect a number? Does it expect uh, a string? So on and so forth. That's a huge hint as a developer. That's one less thing I need to go. I don't need to go look the documentation to figure out what this is. Um, and it sometimes can even auto complete your uh, like different um, input bindings that are available. So you're like, oh yeah. So you could start typing that prefix. It's like, all right, it's uh, what, what did I say? My awesome library, M A L. So if I start typing that, it'll like shorten the list of things down to the things available to my library. So this is where it's really useful to have all that strict typing. If you can't get there right away, just start with where you can and make sure you do that from the beginning on, you know, wherever you start. And at some point, I, I, I think the, we had to do this at, se at several times as TypeScript got more strict itself. Like at beginning TypeScript was, it was good, but didn't have nearly as much um, opinions. And later on, it got much more opinionated as we updated Angular and TypeScript. So we had to go through occasionally and enhance the quality of our typing inf definitions. And so anytime you relax those things, it gets really hard to um, fix that later. So the sooner you do it, the better. But even if you can just start with sections, maybe if you can, it, I always recommend finding like to, how do you zone, find a zone to work in? So. Maybe you can't do it for all of your code at once. Maybe you can do it for one component at a time. Um, figure that out, get through all the errors that you see there. So break it up and then kind of continually make little adjustments there. That will be better than if you try to do everything all at once and then you never finish it because by the time you're done, it's you know code is shifted and whatnot. So little quick wins on that stuff makes a big difference. But the strict typing, it's, it's just huge for development, huge for like documentation. It's like self-documenting in a sense. And then also uh, all of the build tooling can check that and tell you right away, this is not a number, please give a number and could save you minutes to hours of debugging. Yeah, great, great. Because um, I think uh, on a personal experience, uh, when I started off uh, writing um, in, in Angular, Angular application, I remember you could just initialize and I mean, like just write a variable or something and like give it, you would initialize it. But then with um, that, uh, the updates and whatever right now with TypeScript, like you can create a variable, give it a type, but it will always give you that error. Like, yeah, you, you need to initialize it, which I think it makes someone at least think more about the application and really understand, okay, so if I have this type or this model, like how do I get to initialize it, which makes someone, I'd, I'd say makes someone a better developer for sure. Yeah. I think um, of it like the yeah, speed yeah, sure. at which you develop. Sometimes strict typing gets in the way of doing something quick. And, you know, I want to sometimes just quickly make something work just to test an idea. And I'm having to like build an interface. I'm like, I don't want to do this any. And so I just do that. Um, 
So sometimes I still do that, but when it comes to actually building something out, yeah, it makes you think more about, okay, what are the properties I'm adding? Why? What are their values? So the general idea is a lot of this is slow down. You need to stop, think through, and it's worth that upfront time to just think through and, and get those details right. Because once you share that code with five projects or however many projects, um, changes are five times harder to introduce because you might have to change it in that many places. So you lose control over the long term. So you want to avoid breaking changes. You want to minimize that impact. So the more you think of that upfront, the better. That said, when you can't, that's what the schematic stuff is really helpful for to help automatically fix stuff if you can. But then again, sometimes it takes more time to write the schematic than it does to just go in and fix the code. So you need to figure out what that looks like, but it also depends on how much you control. You know, So internally, which is most people I think are probably thinking about this as a internal design system or at least their own library, um, still treat it like it is some sort of external, almost an open source thing, even though it may be internal. Treat it like it is so that you think of it as its independent thing. You put more planning into it and more care so that you minimize the frustration of keeping up to date because that is going to be a big limiter for teams using it if they can't update and if they have different production cycles or deadlines or whatever if if it comes down that the design systems keeping them from updating to angular 13 or whatever is going on uh people are going to be unhappy it's going to slow other people down and you know that causes trust and communication problems and so forth so the more you can uh do that up front the better Um, I have one question here from one of the attendees, and uh, it's got to do with tree shaking. Um, and the question, the question is more related to uh, how, for example, you architect an application, an Angular app, and then you have a file like a shared module where you put in there anything that's shared across the application, whether the dead picker, whether it's a reactive forms module, um generally anything that's being shared that could be put in there like mm -hmm. what are the pros and cons of having such a file like will it um affect your app's performance or is it better when it comes to the apps i don't know ways of doing things yeah so the I, first off think about those shared things as a collection of shared things not as a big blob of stuff that you're going to share everything, but think of it as a bucket. And inside of that bucket, you're actually going to have lots of smaller buckets. So what, what I think is going to help most with tree shaking is think of those logical units, which of these groups are things that make sense together. So for example, in a design system, you're going to have, let's say you have 20, you have 20 UI controls. Okay. You've got a, you've got a button, you've got an accordion, you've got Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Each of those is probably a module that you want to separate from the rest of the shared stuff, and then you can create a a shared library module that just imports all of those smaller buckets. So it's kind of like an extra layer that it's a little bit of work, but what then Angular can do is it can tree shake out those sub modules, the the little ones, out of the shared bucket based on if those things have been used or not. So if nothing's used, Angular tree shaking will get rid of those. So that's why if you create the two layer module, you get better tree shaking. If you just put everything into one big bucket, into one module, uh, if any one thing is used, that whole module is retained. So if you put all of your all of your form elements in the same module, if you only use the text input, then they're all still there in the code base. So it will slow your down your code down a little bit in the sense that you'll have extra code loaded into the browser. So download speeds will be, depending on how big that is, that could be a, a problem. Uh, it doesn't affect your runtime performance a whole lot, but it is a little bit more initially to start up because all that stuff gets um, bootstrapped and Angular has to know about it. So it is it is executed, but then it it doesn't really cause ongoing issues as long as it's not used. So most of the cost is in delivery of code over the network, and then the overhead of having to register and start up. But once it's started, most of that stuff is largely ignored. 
So that, that two tiered modules is really helpful to help um, separate that out. But in the future, maybe these component without uh, the, the modulus components that if you go check out the Angular blog and see the latest blog post about will help maybe avoid the need for having to do modules at all, depending on what your approach is. But for now, that's the best thing to do with the two layers. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, anyone else who has a question? Please feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is Alex. Evening. Yes, uh, this is, uh, sorry I joined the session late. I had uh, some bit of work to catch up. Uh, my question uh, relates to, uh, I think it may uh, be somewhere in between uh, doing a library and uh, okay let me give you the scenario I'm dealing with uh, some an, an app that is a uh, an pretty old uh, monolith with uh, angular components that are bundled via webpack and uh, we inject them into uh, JSP templates now um, I'll, I'm having a situation whereby uh for lack of a better word let me call it a long living component that should be able to transcend uh, different uh pages rather when you go to this page you can be able to find uh something that is injected from that component dynamically so now i was thinking uh should i use uh, because the components are brought in through uh ng factory is it wise uh to try and create uh, or rather inject an instance of a service that uh, this component, wherever it is instantiated, can consume that. And then that service is going to live inside the window instance so that you can always be able to return a static instance of that service anytime. Or would a library do, given the scenario that this web, com this uh, Angular is being consumed as components rather than an? An Angular app itself. I don't know whether I'm, I've, I've explained well enough. Uh, so let me let me see if I can repeat a little back. So your app, it's not an Angular app so much as it is you've got the JSP is rendering these pages with Angular components inside of it. Yeah. And you want to be able to share data across components or pages. Uh, rather, it's like a notification component that if you visit any of the pages in the spring, it's actually a spring uh, spring app. If you visit any of the spring application pages, you'll always see a notification pop up if it is live, if that notification is live, irrespective of which page you are in. But okay. this, uh, this notification lives in an Angular component. And um, if the notification is closed on page one, if you go to page 10, it, uh, it should not appear. But if you went to page one, ignored it, and went to page 10, it will appear. But if you close it in page 10 and go back to page three, it should not appear. OK. So this, uh, this when you're mixing build systems, sometimes things can get a little bit interesting like this. So this is my best guess as far as I understand how things are working. but. When when I think of a system like this, this is a uh, universal thing, right? It's on every page of every app or anything, right? It's it's a global thing, but it is not possible to do that at the Angular level because Angular is not the global thing. Yeah. Uh, okay. So in that case, I think of this is actually a really good case for like a web component that isn't part of Angular because it can be instantiated and maintain some state inside of itself. And you probably want to think about how could I leverage something like um, the, the, the database in the browsers uh, or caching there. What, what can you do to store some of that information? So even if that component's re-rendered on different mm -hmm. pages, it mm -hmm. can, can first check, hey, was I rendered before and what did I have? And if not, go pull information from the back end when it needs it. So it might be that in this case, if it's something that is truly universal across different pages, you might consider either like an Angular element or a custom element that sits outside. Um, and even if you don't, if you still had 
the notification component and it's on you know all 10 pages let's just imagine 10 pages um mm -hmm. most of that is going to be caching can you check the cache and store it somewhere in the browser so that you keep that in memory and even if that component's rebooted at any point um, it mm -hmm. should check that first and in the background double check with the service to say hey is there anything new since 10 minutes yeah. ago all right that's generally how I would approach that type of a problem. And so, yeah, how do you set up the components? And I think you have a few options there, but really that caching layer is going to be the essential thing. All right. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll explore the local storage option and see how I can be able to implement that. I love local storage or index DB can also be great right. if there's lots of records that you want to store as a mini database but um yeah also or, mm -hmm. keeping it simple is good <laughs> yeah 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 all right thank you my pleasure thank you alex um anyone else was a question before we close up okay 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 uh, there's no question um yeah, I'd like to say a big thank you to you, Jeremy. Thank you for taking the time getting us through this. Um, this has been extremely helpful and uh, it's been a well learning experience personally for me and I hope for the other attendees too. And it's, it's definitely something that we will strive to implement um, in our projects at work and all that. And what I usually tell people whom I Come across is that if you learn a better way of doing stuff, always teach your fellow developers because it will definitely help in the long run. Um, because again, whenever you're building an Angular application, you're always looking at things like scalability and maintainability. So some of these tips really, really help uh, not only for you but for other future developers who will be joining your company. You know, they want to come and see like, okay, so how did you architect this app? Uh, and, and, and I usually say the best app is the one that you just give it to a developer and they'll just understand it immediately. Probably just give them like a few minutes to just see how it's architected. So this was really, really helpful. And um, yeah, for those who joined probably a bit late, no worries at all, uh, we're going to have this video up on our YouTube channel by tomorrow afternoon. So definitely be on the lookout. And uh, for the slides, I don't know, Jeremy, would you be willing to share so that we can also share it with the community? Yeah, I'll After get that this, sent to you. Yeah, okay, sure, sure. So I will share all the resources that um, Jeremy will have shared with me. And everything is going to be also on the YouTube um, video description. And yeah, without, if there's nothing else, I'd like to bring the meeting to a close. Jeremy, do you have any closing remarks? Just thank you. Uh, this was fun. I uh, hope that was useful. I'll send the links out, but. Uh, you can try to reach me through Twitter or whatnot if you have additional questions. Might be able to give a little context, but cool. overall, just excited to have been here and thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And thank you all and wishing you all a good evening and wishing you a good day, Jeremy. Thank you. Bye, everyone. All right, bye.